Uh, my name is Stephanie Bell. I'm with Ellinger and Associates, and I'm the president of the Jefferson City chapter of the Federalist Society. To the 150 of you who are with us today, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, in the last four years, we've been fortunate enough to host the statewide Federalist Society Conference in the beautiful state capitol. And I believe one of our attendees is there now, maybe. Um, and of course, we hope to return there next year. Um, so a little bit more first before we begin about the Federalist Society. Membership in the Federalist Society is open to all. You do not need to be a lawyer, um, a law student, or have anything to do with the legal profession. Indeed, we have many non-members joining us today. So if you are new to the Federalist Society, what you should know is the Federalist Society is committed to three main principles. First, that the state exists to preserve freedom. Second, that separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution. And third, that the duty of the judiciary is to say what the law is, not what it should be. We are lucky enough to have three lawyers chapters here in Missouri, one in Mid-Missouri, one in St. Louis, and one in Kansas City, and several thriving student chapters as well. So to learn more about the Federalist Society and to join, you can go to fedsoc.org. And today we do have some people to thank. So first, the National Federal Society organization has a wonderful staff who helps make events like these possible. So thank you to Lisa Azell, Kate Fugate, and Alessandra Cruz, who we have leaned heavily on this year to continue to be able to provide you with quality programming and who have been instrumental in helping us with the event today. In addition, thanks to our chapter leaders, Mark Remmer and Eddie Grime, who you will hear from later today, and thanks to our other chapter volunteers who have helped specifically with this event and with our virtual programming throughout this year. Also, thank you to our members. FedSoc looked very different this year uh, than past years, and I know one of my favorite parts of this organization is discussing and debating the important issues of the day with you in person. And we appreciate you sticking with us in this unusual year, and we are confident we will be returning to our regularly scheduled in-person programming again soon. With that, we have a stellar lineup of topics, moderators and speakers for you today. And I'm pleased to introduce you to Mark Bremer of the law firm of Shans Albert in St. Louis, who is the president of our St. Louis Lawyers Chapter. Mark. Thank you very much, Stephanie. The title of the first panel is The Future of the Missouri Constitution, <clears throat> Constitutional Convention, question mark, initiative petition reform, question mark. It is now my distinct honor to introduce our moderator for this panel, Judge Steve Clark of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Missouri. Judge Clark was sworn in on the federal bench in June of 2019. He is a graduate of St. Louis University School of Law and the University of Notre Dame. Before taking the bench, Judge Clark had extensive litigation experience. He was the founding and managing partner of Runnymede Law Group, formerly known as Clark and Sauer, a national litigation practice representing clients in trials and appeals of complex commercial and constitutional litigation. Before founding that firm, Judge Clark had been a partner at several major law firms in St. Louis. In addition to his extensive civil litigation experience and practice, he also tried over 200 cases to conclusion as a municipal prosecutor. During his career, his national practice included handling cases in over 20 federal district courts, five federal circuit courts of appeal, and the courts of nine separate states. Judge Clark, I now turn it over to you to introduce our topic and our presenters. Thank you, Mark, for that fine introduction, and thank you for having me here. Thank you to you, and thank you to Stephanie and to the Federalist Society. I appreciate you putting on this event, and it's, uh, we're going to discuss a very important issue here today, and we're going to discuss the future of the Missouri Constitution. Now, the question I would first pose, is this a solution in search of a problem, or is this a problem in search of a solution? And so we're going to hear about that today. We're going to hear about... Um, the number of initiative petitions that have been filed over the years and have been on the ballot over the years. Some of those have passed by overwhelming margins. Some of those been, have passed by very close margins. Some of those have failed by overwhelming margins. Some of those have passed by overwhelming margins. So, uh, or failed rather by overwhelming margins. So you'll see 
that uh, the, the, the Constitution has been amended and attempted to be amended a number of times in, in the last couple of decades alone. So that forms one of the issues. Another issue is that currently pending in the Missouri legislature are a number of bills to uh, amend the constitutional amendment process. Some of them include making the, uh, creating the, a greater threshold than, than a simple majority. And uh, Speaker Weinman will go into a detail on some of those as well. And uh, the, the, just by comparison, uh, the Missouri Constitution versus the United States Constitution, this will help frame the issue and, and, and help you decide whether you think there is an issue and whether there's a need for a constitutional convention and whether there is a need to change the amendment process. But the, the United States Constitution, including all 27 amendments, contains 7,591 words. The Missouri Constitution, by contrast, is more than 10 times longer at nearly 82,000 words. So with that, some of the provisions of the Missouri Constitution that have been passed by the initiative and perhaps others uh, read to some much more like legislation than they do like a constitutional provision. Those of you who are familiar with the United States Constitution and some of the, uh, I will call fundamental provisions of the, of the Missouri Constitution, those that were enacted to be analogs to provisions of the Missouri, of the uh, United States Constitution, tend to be shorter provisions. They tend to leave many of the fleshing out of the details of how those provisions will be implemented to the legislature. And some have said that the issue with respect to the Missouri Constitution, or at least an issue with respect to the Missouri Constitution, is that it's taking away powers from the legislature and the query whether that's a good thing, because once they're in the Constitution, they can't be changed other than by another constitutional amendment. So with that uh, as our background, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, who is James R. Layton. Jim Layton is a formerly Missouri Solicitor General. He's now with the firm of Tooth, Kinney, Cooper, Mohan, and Jagstadt in uh, the St. Louis area. He's the head of a, the appellate group of that firm. For 22 years, Mr. Layton served in the Attorney General's office, and for 19 of them, he was the state's principal civil appellate lawyer. He's handled all litigation, or he was responsible for handling all litigation arising under the Missouri Constitution and handle cases involving proposed constitutional amendments. Jim has argued nearly 100 times before the Missouri Supreme Court, four times before the US Supreme Court, and more than 100 times in other state and federal appellate courts. So I think it's fair to say that Jim is a rather experienced appellate litigator at all levels of the appellate process. And with that, we're in good hands because he's very familiar with the issues at hand. He was also an adjunct professor at the, uh, of law at the University of Missouri, teaching not only appellate practice, but state constitutional law. He has a number of organizations he belongs to and is chair of. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers. So with that, I turn it over to you, Jim Layton. Thank you, Judge. Uh, and thanks to, to the Federal Society for inviting me. I, I sometimes feel like I'm the uh, the non-Federalist Society member who frequently gets the opportunity to speak to uh, Federalist Society seminars. Although I admit my favorite was speaking to a student chapter a few years ago about the Trinity Lutheran case that I argued in the US Supreme Court, where I began by saying that I might be the only real Federalist in the room because I was standing up for the states and my opponent, a member of the Federalist Society was standing up for federal power. Um, I'd like to share my screen and I will uh, put a graphic uh, version up of one of the things that Judge Clark mentioned. Um, one of the things that's different between the US Constitution and the Missouri Constitution is simply its length. It used to be when I was in person that I'd hand out uh, the Secretary of State's booklets that have the Missouri Constitution and the US Constitution and have everyone put their finger where the two divide. It is a pretty dramatic difference between the two, but I'll put it up on the screen in this way. If you look at 1820, when our first constitution was drafted for the state of Missouri, that was only slightly longer, a thousand words per, uh, or so longer than the US Constitution at that time. The US Constitution has grown slightly since then, 
our constitution, uh, my numbers are a little different than uh, Judge Clark's because there are various ways to count, um, but our constitution uh, is dramatically longer and has gotten much longer in the last few years. Uh, in fact, if you look just in the last uh, 14, 15 years, uh, the, the blue here is what existed uh, in 2007. The other two colors are the things that have happened since then. And uh, the, the gray is simply the medical marijuana uh, amendment, which constitutes Article 14 of the Missouri Constitution today. So there is a, a, certainly a difference in the detail that we see there. We have what uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes once referred to as the great ordinances, these, these general statements. Uh, we have a couple that don't exist in the US Constitution and yet embody concepts that we deal with in US constitutional law, such as the separation of powers, which is expressly stated in our constitution in article two, and the right to, to vote. Uh, election shall be free and open, which uh, it doesn't appear anywhere in the U.S. Constitution, but it is in our Constitution and has played a role in uh, regard to the uh, question of voter ID. But then look at things by contrast like this. No bingo license shall be granted to an organization unless it's been in existence for five years. And here's how you decide whether it's been in existence for five years. Or here's a crime. There actually is a crime defined in the Missouri Constitution. It's in the stem cell provision. Or here in the medical marijuana provision, you have a limit uh, on how many square feet can be in a manufacturing facility and how many flowering plants can be in that facility. There is nothing in the US Constitution anything like uh, these kinds of provisions that we have in ours. So why does ours look so different? Well, one reason is that the US Constitution was drafted as a delegation of powers, limited powers from the states to the federal government. And so it talks about a, kind of affirmatively, the federal government can do this, not what it can't do, but what it can do. State constitutions aren't that way. State con the states have all power, except where it's limited by the federal government, by the federal constitution or federal statute. That's one of the reasons why there was a debate about whether Congress could pass Obamacare. There was no constitutional debate about whether uh, Massachusetts could pass Romney care. Uh, the state legislature in Missouri can do anything that it wants as long as it doesn't violate federal law, except as limited by the Missouri constitution. And it has simply taken more words to craft the way in which we're going to let the, or say the legislature can't ask, act, that it, the founders used to tell Congress where it could act. So there's another reason, which is just the, the, the methods of change. And so you know that uh, for, for the US Constitution, Congress can initiate an amendment that, that takes a two thirds vote in Congress, uh, then has to be ratified by the states. Um, or there can be a convention, which requires a call from three quarters of the state legislatures. Whether that can be a limited call so that that uh, convention can only do some things like uh, adopt a balanced budget amendment uh, is a question we don't know because there hasn't been a constitutional convention in uh, the United States since the, the uh, uh, constitution was adopted. By contrast, in Missouri, uh, we also can have amendments proposed by the General Assembly, but it merely takes a majority vote. And uh, they can come by initiative petition, by getting signatures. And then they're ratified not by three quarters of the states, but by 50% plus one vote. Uh, so if a thousand people voted in the election and uh, 501 of them voted, then that would be part of the Missouri Constitution, regardless of how, what low turnout there happened to be. We do have a provision for a convention. And every 20 years, we have a vote in Missouri on whether to have a constitutional convention. Uh, 1942, the vote was yes. In 1962, 82, 2002, the vote was no. I always wonder, and I can't ask you because I don't see you in front of me, how many of you remember voting on that in 2002? When I first started uh, teaching state constitutional law in Mizzou, I would ask students if their parents uh, remembered voting on it in uh, 1982. 
Uh, most people don't recall. In 1942, there was a concerted effort uh, to get a constitutional convention done by good government groups like the League of Women Voters, but also by the uh, substantial portions of the Missouri business community. A convention in Missouri cannot be a limited call. It is a constitutional convention. And it's based on a convention that we got our constitution in 1945, our current constitution, as well as constitutions in 1875 and 1865. And a whole bunch of amendments that were proposed by the convention that convened after the 1922 vote, uh, but didn't actually come up with a new, uh, a new constitution. So why else do we look different? Well, if you pair the, how easy it is to change the Missouri Constitution with the distrust of the Missouri General Assembly among the public, then you get this need that people feel to put things in the Constitution instead of putting them into a statute. Um, and a few years ago, well, I guess uh, in 2019, um, in thinking about this and recognizing that the General Assembly was, uh, was looking at ways to address the amendment process in Missouri. I called a couple of uh, people I know, Michael Wolf, who had been the Dean of the law school at, uh, at uh, SLU and also a member of the Missouri Supreme Court, and David Rowland, who is an attorney in Mexico, Missouri. These are two who, like me, have spent a lot of time over the years looking at the Missouri Constitution. And my idea was to see if the three of us could come up with some proposal for a way in which we could try and improve and hopefully shorten the Missouri Constitution. And so we sat down uh, in, in person and then a number of times by phone and hammered out uh, a set of three proposals that, uh, that we uh, wrote about in a post-dispatch um, uh, op-ed in 2019. Um, they have not been even proposed in the General Assembly, much less uh, adopted by the, by the people of Missouri. So the first proposal that we made was to make changing the Constitution harder, not proposing change, but make changing the Constitution harder. Our view was that the problem here does not arise because people find it too easy to get something on the ballot. Frankly, it is very difficult to get something on the ballot. And although there's a lot of legislation out there that would make it even harder, it is very hard to get something on the ballot. Uh, you have to have thousands of signatures in much of the state, not every place in the state. And I noticed that one of the proposals that's in the legislature is to require signatures in a certain number in every county. I suspect that that may not be a constitutional under the US Constitution, but that, that's a proposal. Uh, there are proposals to, uh, to increase the numbers, but our concept, uh, uh, David and, and Mike and, and I, was to instead really focus on the uh, putting something in the Constitution. Because our view was that it should take a, a more of, a, of the support of the people of the state of Missouri to change its Constitution, our founding document, than to simply uh, enact legislation. And the proposal we made, and there are many others that could be made, the proposal we made was uh, rather than require some kind of supermajority, uh, to simply say it's got to pass twice, unless it's a su real supermajority the first time. And so instead of having things that, uh, that come to a head in one year and everybody thinks uh, this is great, we really got to act on this, our view was that things in the Constitution are things that should uh, uh, require more deliberation and have support over time, not just one time. And not just for initiative petitions, but for the legislature. That it shouldn't be enough that the legislature in one year says, this horrible thing has happened. We have to amend our constitution. They could say that, but in our view, the people should have to two years later think, yeah, that's still a good idea, instead of, oh, come on. That may have been important then, but let's take a second look. Our second proposal was to reduce the incentive, people's perceived need to uh, amend the Constitution rather than to simply have legislation. And I understand why people have an incentive to do that, because we have seen instances in which uh, legislation is passed by initiative and the legislature immediately uh, repeals, guts, changes, makes it something other than what was intended. 
And our view is that the legislature ought to, absent a supermajority, ought to, for a period of time, not be able to change the people's will. But you can have a supermajority to correct an error. And part of the problem with having these things in the Constitution is that if we, it turns out that that's not the, uh, the ideal number for a marijuana growing facility, you can't change that without going back to the ballot. And if we could reduce the incentive to put things in the Constitution, we could open the door to legislative change, but not as easy as it is today. And then our final proposal was one that arises in part because if you make it harder to amend the Constitution, you make it harder to make changes to correct problems in the Constitution, regardless of, uh, of what you may think, right, left, liberal, conservative, whatever you may be, it's possible that in drafting a medical marijuana provision, for example, you just screw up something. And we thought there ought to be a way to fix that, but there also ought to be a way to systematically go through the Constitution and find things that shouldn't be there anymore. Maybe we could get out the provision declared unconstitutional that women can opt out of juries, uh, for example. The time has come in our view to create a more modern constitution and it doesn't have to happen uh, by having a convention. Uh, the proposal we made was to have a bipartisan constitutional review commission, one that could go uh, step by step, article by article, section by section through the constitution and propose new language, hopefully shorter language, hopefully clearer language uh, that could be used in our constitution. Our proposal was that uh, that be handed to the legislature, which hopefully would put things on the ballot, uh, but also that uh, with some kind of supermajority in that commission, it would be able to put things on the ballot itself. One of the suggestions I made that uh, did not make it into our opt-ed, which suggests to you that uh, Mr. Rowland and Mr. Wolf didn't necessarily agree, um, was that there be a provision in the Constitution that would allow this bipartisan commission to simply transform something like the medical marijuana provision into a statute. So it could put on the ballot a provision that says, okay, this is no longer part of the Constitution. It is now a statute um, and will remain uh, without legislative change for a period of time, but let's pull these things that shouldn't have ever been in the Constitution and make them statutes. So those are kind of the proposals that we have. I will close by saying that I am not particularly optimistic about a convention being very productive. I used to tell my students at Mizzou starting back in the 90s that I thought that any constitutional convention would probably deadlock on abortion questions. I think that is still reasonable, a uh, reasonable assumption that that would happen. But I also think that in the kind of increasingly partisan world in which we live, uh, that the convention, which would be bipartisan, not nonpartisan, or the way we crafted it is bipartisan, that it probably would not be an effective method of just taking a hard look, a hard, hopefully a somewhat unbiased look at the Constitution and trying to craft something that better serves us in the 21st century. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. So um, one thing for our audience members, Feel free to submit questions through the Zoom Q&A function at any time throughout today's program. We will have a Q&A session uh, at the end and uh, we, we have a hard stop at 1.30, but uh, before then, as I say, we'll have some time for Q&A. So please submit those and I'll be uh, checking into them as they come in and, and we'll keep things moving forward there. So with that, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker and that is Lowell Pearson. Lowell Pearson is the office managing partner and serves on the executive board of Hush Blackwell. He's a graduate of Stanford Law School and he has degrees from the University of Utah as well as the University of Missouri Columbia. His practice is a mix of administrative law, election and campaign finance law, litigation and appellate work. And he's represented a number of committees and individuals in the initiative and referendum area. So he's familiar with this whole process of not only the uh, amendment of the constitution either or, and the uh, statutory amendment process, but he's been involved in litigating those issues as well. And uh, most recently was involved in uh, representing the 2020 Medicaid expansion effort. And he was involved in the drafting strategy and litigation involving that. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Lowell Pearson. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Judge. 
Um, following Jim Layton talking about the Missouri Constitution is a bit of a challenge. Uh, Jim, good to see you. And uh, what I'm going to try to do here is talk at two levels. I'm going to start big, and then I'm going to go down a little bit at a granular level and talk about how this really has been functioning for the last decade. So when I was preparing for this uh, presentation, one of the questions I asked myself, well, is this a new problem or is this an old problem? And the data that Jim showed about the size of the Missouri Constitution, uh, you know, might suggest it's a newer problem. Uh, but I don't think that's right because this whole issue of how to amend the Constitution is something that goes back uh, to before the Constitution was written. In fact, uh, just uh, something I didn't know, but I learned yesterday in uh, the, the original Virginia Constitution, which was written under the Articles uh, of Confederation, Thomas Jefferson actually proposed an initiative petition uh, uh, or initi an initiative process. I don't know if we would have had people standing in Walmart signing, uh, signing petitions, but so it, it really wasn't a new idea to think about a avenue of direct democracy. Um, the first one was adopted in Massachusetts shortly after the constitution was created. Um, I also thought it would be interesting to think about how we amend the Missouri constitution, which Jim described with the thinking of the founding fathers when they wrote the, the, the United States constitution. And as it turns out, they didn't really think it was that hard to amend the federal constitution when they wrote it. If you look back at some of the writings of, of Hamilton, not in the Federalist Papers at the time, and then also at Federalist 43 and Federalist 85, there's discussion that they thought they had gotten that mix just right. Um, so since we have this huge disparity in how easy it is to amend the two constitutions. Um, but they, like I said, they didn't think it was going to be all that hard. Now, history has proven that the federal constitution is difficult to amend. Uh, there have been 27 amendments, I think I counted right, uh, since it was adopted. And of course, many of those were immediately adopted as the Bill of Rights, which was sort of a grand compromise that those not appear in the text of the original constitution, but that they, uh, the idea was that they would quickly uh, be added. If you look at the time period other than the, the, the Bill of Rights and the post-Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, we really had very little amendatory activity with the United States Constitution. So while I was going on my little walk down uh, history lane yesterday, uh, I also saw that this is not a new issue for the courts. I, I had forgotten this, but we all remember McCulloch uh, versus Maryland, right? The case that involved the second bank of the United States and the, uh, uh, the Maryland collector refused to collect the tax that was imposed. And uh, Judge, uh, Justice uh, Marshall wrote the opinion for the court. By, by the way, uh, I didn't know this, but Jim, who's argued hundreds of cases, has probably never argued a case like McCulloch versus Maryland. There was nine days of oral argument. And uh, Daniel Webster was one of the lawyers. And uh, the opinion was issued three days after the oral argument ended. Now, I've had a few cases with opinions issued a couple of hours after the oral argument. And I was pretty skeptical that the argument really mattered, but uh, you know, they, they certainly uh, certainly did it differently in those days. That I, I, I was amused by that historic, historical footnote. But in the opinion, uh, Justice Marshall talked about how the federal constitution should not be read as quote, what he called a legal code. In other words, a statutory document. And the issue there, of course, was whether the Congress had the power to create the Second Bank of the United States. And picking up on Jim's uh, comments about what the federal constitution is, is really what, uh, what was discussed in the case, which is it is a broad statement of what the federal power is. Article 1, Section 8 of the, of the US Constitution has something 20 plus enumerated powers. 
and then the necessary and proper clause, which was the issue in the bank of the in, in the McCulloch versus Maryland case with the second bank. And uh, the court, of course, in McCulloch versus Maryland, as I'm sure everyone remembers, um, I had to look it up because I didn't remember, uh, ruled that the bank was, uh, was permissible as a necessary and proper function to the enumerated powers. So uh, last thing that I uh, will talk about here in the historical section, and then we'll get to what goes on in Missouri as a practical matter, is that the initiative petition process was also thought about by the founding fathers. And while, um, or at least some sort of direct uh, democracy, maybe it wouldn't be uh, petitions, but in Federalist 49, Madison uh, talked about how the ultimate power is that of the people, but he says that that power should recur to the same original authority, in other words, the people, quote, whenever it may be necessary to enlarge, diminish, or new model the powers of government. Now, of course, there's no mechanism in the United States Constitution to do that. So why he was uh, discussing it in, in Federalist 49 is maybe something of a mystery, but it, this whole concept of how should the Constitution be amended uh, what's the appropriate level of difficulty? Should there be a, a role for the people to do it? Was all something that was being discussed 200 plus years ago. So uh, our conversation today, uh, I, I hope in the next hour, we will solve all of the unresolved questions from the last 220 years. But uh, Hamilton and Madison didn't do it. So maybe we won't either, but we'll try. Um, so with that broad picture, let me now talk about what's going on in Missouri. Uh, and as, uh, as the judge said, I've advised uh, people who have put things on the ballot and succeeded. I've advised people who failed to get on the ballot through no fault of their lawyer. And I've, uh, I've uh, represented people who have got things on the ballot and failed. Um, so just a, a, a little bit of statistics, because I think Everybody sits around and says, oh my gosh, we have way too many initiative petitions. I mean, uh, there's, there's too much of this. They're, they're, uh, and we'll talk about the quality of the output in a minute, but let's just talk about volume. I think that there is a conventional wisdom that there's too much initiative petition activity and there's too much stuff that goes on the ballot to amend the constitution. So, and I'm gonna, in, in the statistics, I'm gonna give you set aside statutory amendments. Those are in a different category. But if you go back to 2012, so several election cycles, we have had 14 measures put on the ballot by the legislature. And we have eight that have succeeded by initiative petition. Um, so I don't know that that's obviously too much activity. Um, they range from the minimal to the maximal uh, we have, uh, I'm sure we all re remember the much beloved uh, 2018 uh, bingo measure, which uh, was, a, a, it's always fun to make fun of bingo. It's funny, Jim and I didn't talk about this, but he did. And uh, I had the same plan too. You stole my bingo joke, Jim. But um, we had the bingo measure, which was put on by the legislature in uh, 2018. Um, and, you know, we've had very big measures. Uh, Amendment two in 2016 that imposed campaign contribution limits for the first time since the 90s. Uh, Medicaid expansion that, that I worked on. Uh, all of the uh, clean Missouri and cleaner Missouri that deal with redistricting, which is about as fundamental uh, as it gets. So we have, we have big measures uh, and we have small measures. Um, and there's really no discernible pattern to, to this that I was able to, to figure out either. As probably most people know, when measures are placed on the ballot, they by the Constitution, they are on the next general election ballot after the signatures are certified by the Secretary of State. But the governor maintains the ability to call a special election for any measure. And governors have done exercise that power frequently. Uh, that was done by Governor Parson uh, with the Medicaid expansion measure, which uh, was on the August 2020 ballot, probably the most 
uh, famous example was in 2014, when then Governor Nixon put several measures, including a sales tax for transportation uses uh, on, the, uh, on the August ballot. Um, and, and certainly governors do that with an expectation of, you know, the turnout that's different in the, in the, in the different elections. Uh, I think the last thing I'll talk about is a little bit of the strategy and the constitutionalization, if that's a word, of measures that might not have been in the Constitution before. So there used to be a conventional wisdom in this initiative petition world that uh, putting things in the Constitution was not the right strategy in many cases. And there was two parts of that conventional wisdom. One is it's just more expensive because you have to gather more signatures, about 30% more. Um, so it was, you had to raise more money up front and there was a higher failure rate um, of failing to gather. And just while we're talking gathering as a footnote, you need to gather X number of signatures in six of the eight congressional districts. Uh, it's 5% for a statutory measure and 8% of those voting in the last, for a constitutional of those voting in the last uh, governor's election. Um, but anyway, the conventional wisdom used to seem to be don't go for a constitutional amendment unless you really feel you have to. Uh, they, again, there was a cost and a, and a uh, you might fail uh, element to it. There was also a, a, a very strong conventional wisdom that the voters disliked constitutional amendments and that there was a three to five point bias against them where pe if you put the very same measure before the voters, a statutory amendment would get about three to 5% more votes uh, than uh, a constitutional measure. And I think that's now kind of out the window. I mean, that was something that people who are active in this world, you know, believed it was part of the thinking, um, but it, it seems to me that that's largely gone. And maybe the best example of that is our uh, medical marijuana measures in 2018 where uh, the, the constitutional measure, uh, which added to the word count a lot, uh, and the uh, pass and the statutory measure uh, did not. So in concluding, I'm just gonna say, I'm, I'm not convinced we really have a problem in Missouri. I mean, the, the, Jim is correct. The Missouri constitution serves a different purpose than a federal constitution. Um, yes, of course, there's some silly stuff in the Missouri Constitution. I don't know that that is any public policy crisis. I do agree with Jim that some reasonable mechanism for error correction is desirable, where we're building these long measures that look like what Justice Marshall called a legal code um, with no none of the usual process in the legislature that the speaker is going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, you know, no ability to correct errors, not, you don't have uh, hundreds of people commenting and, and doing, uh, doing the work to identify problems or inconsistencies. So I tend to worry more about the quality of the work and, and what's in the constitution than the quantity. And uh, I, I think uh, some mechanism where those errors could be corrected within reason and without amending the having to go back to a vote uh, makes quite a bit of sense. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge, for the nice introduction and thanks to the Federalist Society for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lowell. And uh, I see some questions are coming in. So folks keep those questions coming in. As I say, we'll get to those in the Q&A session. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to you, the Speaker Pro Tem of the Missouri House of Representatives, John Wyman, who is a Republican. He represents parts of a, a part of St. Charles County. He was elected to his first two-year term in 2014, has been reelected in 2016, 2018, and most recently, of course, in 2020. He was born in St. Louis, but raised down south on 44 in St. James, Missouri. He's a graduate of the University of Missouri Columbia with a bachelor's in business administration and a master's in health administration. He lives in O'Fallon with his wife and two sons. He's the president and CEO of Midwest Physician Insurance Advisors, which is a brokerage firm specializing in medical malpractice insurance. 
He's a member of a number of boards and chambers of commerce, and he's also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Missouri State Employees Retirement uh, uh, System. So with that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Speaker Pro Tem, John Wyman. Thank you, Judge Clark. I hope you can hear me well. Um, first off, I wanted to thank the uh, Federalist Society for the invitation to be part of this um, panel and look forward to hopefully uh, contributing uh, something to it. I, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I have some written remarks that I'm gonna read, I apologize. I didn't really know what the format was gonna be, so I just wanted to make sure I had something in writing just to kind of express my thoughts on this whole process. But uh, just to kind of get to it, um, really I think the question is the future of the Missouri Constitution um, and the potential of a constitutional convention along with an initiative petition reform measures currently in legislatures is the question that we're all looking at right now. As we know, the Missouri Constitution under Article 12, Section 3A specifically states that every 20 years, the Secretary of State shall and the General Assembly by law may submit to the electors of the state the question, shall there be a convention to revise and amend the Constitution? And I think to understand this, we are, you know, really what we need to look at is this kind of the history of this whole process in Missouri. Since the original construction of the original Constitution was created in 1820, our state has held conventions in 1865, 1875, and 1945, which resulted in our third and, and current version of the state constitution. For the past 59 years, the state has decided to not call for a convention, which I find very interesting. However, the, the movement for initiative petitions has steadily increased over the decades. Uh, Missouri is one of 11 states that allow direct citizen initiative petition for both statutory and constitutional amendments. In reviewing other states' constitutions, there are eight states that don't allow constitutional initiative petitions. There are 16 states that permit direct constitutional initiatives, three states that only allow indirect constitutional initiatives, and 24 states that allow some form of popular referendum leaving 23 states that do not allow any initiative petition or popular referendums. The question before us is, do we need to conduct a constitutional convention? Obviously, from Missouri history, it is not uncommon for our state to not, uh, modify the Constitution. We've done it in the past, and, and there's always that potential we could do it again in the future. Um, over the past 76 years, the Missouri Constitution has grown, as it's been stated before, to well over 80,000 words and contains amended language that most would agree does not belong in the Constitution, but rather in statute. Specifically, we've added the following items, and I like to rattle these off. Sometimes I bring this to attention to my friends in the legislature, um, but the list is, and this is not all encompassing, but I thought you, like, you guys would find this interesting. Uh, bingo, which we've all mentioned, uh, gambling, horse racing, riverboat gambling, lotteries, paramutual wagering, raffles, and and sweepstakes, there seems to be a trend there. Um, blind pension fund, conservation commission, conservation, sales tax, stem cell research, clean Missouri, clean air Missouri, which wasn't a constitutional change, but medical cannabis and Medicaid expansion, to name a few. Um, it certainly appears the Missouri Constitution has evolved into another version of the revised statutes, uh, which leads me back to the original question, do we need to revise our state constitution? I believe there's a growing concern from the citizens that our initiative process is being used by special interest groups who are unable to enact legislation to benefit through the normal legislative process. Case in point, uh, recent attempts by outside political groups to significantly change our redistricting process, i.e. Clean Missouri or amendment, I think it was amendment two, uh, demonstrates the danger of low thresholds required to change our state constitution. The framers of our U.S. Constitution believe that states and our Congress should be able to amend the Constitution, but they also set the bar very high in order to protect against whimsical political ideas of the day. As a result, in over 245 years, we've only amended it 27 times. However, Missouri Constitution has been amended over 60 times in the past 76 years. The problem is simple. It has, it has become too easy to change our Constitution given the modern age of mass media. All you need to do is to collect, and I, and, and I know we have a little bit of disagreement with my friend Lowell Pearson on this, but 
All you need to do is collect a, around 120,000 signatures that are that are valid signatures. You generally have to collect more than that, but um, you only need to go to three counties in this in this state. Now it'll get you six six congressional districts and spend, depending on the issue, anywhere between two to four million dollars in marketing and and then, of course, I always call it the ballot candy uh, language, like clean or medicinal, and the voters will likely approve a simple with, by, with a simple majority vote. Um, while the IP process is an important constitutional to, tool for Missourians, the reality is that most average citizens don't invest the time to read the proposed amendment and rely on basically slick marketing advertisements to educate them, themselves about the virtues of the initiative petition. Bottom line, then amending the state constitution should be difficult, just like it is to, to amend the U.S. Constitution. Now, with regards to specific bills in the General Assembly, I did prepare a summary document, which I hope has been distributed to uh, those who are on this call. I don't have it on my computer, but um, which basically explains the existing bills and resolutions that are, that are currently before the legislature right now. And uh, I'll just kind of briefly cover, there's 12 bills specifically or resolutions that have been filed. And I'll just kind of cover the, some of the common themes that are out there right now. Uh, one in particular is some uh, related to the Secretary of State's uh, office and an administrative process, um, kind of changing the filing fees, increasing those, um, and also certain procedures regarding uh, signature collection and reporting. And then also requiring maybe him to have a um, online database that uh, could be easily accessible for citizens to look at Who's, who's putting forth these, uh, these initiative petitions and who's out there collecting signatures. Another one um, deals with signature requirements for constitutional amendments be 8% of legal voters in all eight congressional districts. Now that's pretty serious increase in requirements because as you know, right now you only need to get six out of the eight congressional districts and um, it doesn't have to be of total voters. It's um, this, this one here would be, would be a little bit higher threshold well, a lot higher threshold. Uh, also, signature requirements should change from congressional to each county. That's another one that's pretty substantial. We have 114 counties in this state, and that would be a significant um, barrier, I believe, to, uh, to gathering signatures for an initiative petition. That also would include 5% of voters in each county for statutory amendments and 8% of voters in each county for constitutional amendments. Another requirement that's being proposed is that every petition include the name of the individual or group sponsoring the petition and to be subject to financial disclosure provisions under state law. Some of that's already already in, in statute right now, um, but this is another attempt to try to identify those who are individuals or groups that are specifically trying to, uh, to move a, a particular issue um, through an initiative petition process. Another one is the requirement to collect signatures for 12% of legal voters in every congressional district and then submit to the General Assembly for approval to the place on the ballot. Once again, that's raising the, the standard pretty high. I mean, the, the highest standard right now is, is 8% for constitutional. Um, this would go to 12% of all legal voters. So that's, that's a much higher threshold. Another pr um, proposal is to prohibit the modification. This is actually of personal interest because this is my bill. Uh, House Bill 850 is to prevent, uh, prohibit the modification of summary statements or ballot language approved by the General Assembly or constitutional amendments or statutory measures. Uh, courts would not have jurisdiction to rewrite or edit such language prior to placing it on the ballot. Um, the idea behind that particular proposal is that you know, the legislature, uh, we have Senate joint resolutions, House joint resolutions, we put the issues to the vote of the people. Um, we, we sometimes put in uh, ballot language. In most cases, we do. We put our, our specific ballot language that we want to have um, to be, you know, before the voters. And what's happening is that it's being, you know, it, that process is being usurped by the courts because our opponents of that particular resolution will file a lawsuit, take it to court. And then now we have uh, circuit courts, appeals courts, Supreme courts rewriting ballot language that went through a pretty extensive legislative process and um, so that's that's really the, the premise behind that. Um, another thing is to require ballot language to be written in plain language, easily understood by an individual with the sixth grade reading level. I don't quite think that bill is going to make it all the way, but this and it's already currently in statute that it has to be in plain language anyway. So that one is not really not really moving at this point in time. But that's just another example of, of what uh, legislators have, have proposed. 
Another one is constitutional amendments require uh, petitions to be signed by 15% of legal voters. So once again, it's the same raising the threshold. Um, I will tell you that I've seen some recent polling data uh, in Missouri regarding the initiative uh, integrity, uh, which suggests that a majority of Missourians support changes to our IP process along with greater transparency. Uh, in particular, one of the questions was posed uh, oftentimes, voters don't know anything about a proposed law or constitutional change until they read it on their ballot when they arrive at the polls. Would you support or oppose requiring ballot initiative sponsors to hold a public hearing where citizens can ask questions about the proposed change before voting on it? Uh, the, the vote count was 82% supported that idea, 99% opposed it, and 12% were unsure. Another question, uh, would you support or oppose requiring petitions for proposed laws and constitutional changes to gather at least 100 valid signatures from each county in, in the state? This is an interesting number, 53% supported that, 29% opposed, and 18% were unsure. So, you know, I, I think in summary, there's no question that I think that we need to strongly consider um, the ability of especially outside groups, special interest groups to be able to come into our state and really kind of usurp and go around the, the, the traditional republic that we have is, is to, to take it through the legislature and have it fully vetted. And so um, I think that's worthy of discussion, whether we do that through the IP process, through a resolution process, or do we do a constitutional convention? I think that's still for debate. But uh, anyway, with that, I'll be happy to conclude my remarks and take any questions. Thank you, Speaker Wyman. And we'll get to the audience's questions in a few minutes after we have a little bit of uh, debate amongst our three panelists here. And I see some more questions are coming in. So um, one topic that I'd, I'd like you all to address a little bit more is this notion of whether a supermajority ought to be required to uh, amend the Constitution or whether it ought to stay the simple majority. Jim, Jim's proposal and Jim and his colleagues' proposal is that it uh, remain a simple majority and that it um, be if uh, uh, vetted by the voters twice. So question, Jim, I'd like you to address is with respect to um, two, why, why does having something pass by 50% plus one vote twice make it any more uh, representative of the people than if it just passes once by 50 plus one percent? And, and I, I'm going to give a, a little bit more framing to that if you'll allow me. The, as you mentioned, the United States Constitution requires two thirds of both legislatures and then three quarters of the state legislatures. When we talk about three quarters of the state legislatures, we're uh, really amping up, if you will, the supermajority uh, pr proposal or supermajority concept because most legislatures in our, in our state, in our uh, country rather, most state legislatures are bicameral. They have a House and a Senate, so you need the, the passage in both the House and the Senate of each state. I think it's, uh, Nebraska is a unicameral legislature, um, and and that that uh, you know there may be another one I, mean, I don't recall. But the notion of having uh, two thirds of the House and the Senate and then three quarters of the state legislatures really has a very very broad base of people voting for it and people's elected representatives. So with that, Jim, my, again, my question just to frame it is the why is uh, twice passing by 50, point, uh, 50 plus one better than just once? Well, it seems to me there are two different things that uh, we try and accomplish by, uh, by changing this, uh, by, by distinguishing between what we can do uh, in legislation versus what we do with the constitutional amendment. Um, one of those is to simply say it takes more. Uh, not it takes more to get it on the ballot. Uh, I and mean, that's where the legislature seems to be focused. And uh, you know, Mike and David and I think that's the wrong way to go. But, uh, but to say to the people, okay, it takes more for you to actually change your constitution than to just change a statute. And that purpose can be served either by the approach that we suggested, which is uh, voting twice. You have to it, it may take the same number, but they're going to have to do it twice, um, or by having some kind of supermajority. And there are certainly states that have 60% or 55% or, or something like that. And I think uh, Mike, Dave, and I would be supportive of making some kind of a change. The reason we put out this, this different approach, which is used in some states, 
is because the other purpose of, uh, of making this distinction is to ensure that we only put the things in our constitution that people have thought about for a while. So it's not enough that there is a concern in 2021 and 2022 uh, for something or that it serves uh, a particular uh, constituency or a particular uh, you know, philosophical group in a political party or something. It serves them to get this on the ballot. Uh, instead, we have to come back and look again. And so it, instead of just saying, okay, everybody's hot on this this year, and so we ought to change our constitution, we would say, if you're not still hot on it two years later, then why are we putting it in the constitution? A statute, maybe, but why are we putting in, it in the constitution if two years later we don't still think this is worth doing? Thank you, Jim. So, Speaker Wyman, um, I'd ask you to address that and your thoughts on uh, why having a, a greater threshold for passing as well as a greater, greater threshold for getting something on the ballot would be beneficial. Well, I think we've seen just in recent history that um, we've had some issues that, you know, for example, uh, Medicaid expansion. I mean, that that was an issue that you know, was pretty contentious in the legislature for many, many years. And, and there was many attempts by very powerful forces to try to get us to to take up and pass Medicaid expansion through the legislature. And it just didn't have the support of the elected officials in, in this state. And, and so what happened then is it just basically was those, those interest groups decided to go around us. And um, I kind of like the idea of the possibility if we don't raise the, the threshold, then at least we put it to the vote twice because it, it kind of gives the option to the, for more time to educate the population and the citizens about what legislation we're looking to add to the constitution or to our statu statutes. So um, I'm more in favor of just raising a threshold for just the, con the constitutional uh, changes that we would make to just to make it even more difficult to change our constitution. Uh, I think most of the, of the, the issues that we've dealt with in the past really should have been statutes versus constitutional changes. But um, there's a, you know, I think most of my members here in the legislature, at least on my side of the aisle, are very much in support of raising the standard, at least on constitutional uh, changes to the to um, our constitution. Thank you, Speaker Wyman. Lowell, I'm going to turn to you and have you address the issue and, and feel free to respond to, to either of those comments first. And then uh, I've got another issue for you to address. OK, yeah, I'll respond briefly. Uh, well, there's one group of people who are doing uh, handstands at Jim's idea of the double voting, which are the political consultants and the media buyers who are now doubling their uh, their income. Um, the lawyers don't get any more money by doing it twice, Jim. You know, so you're you don't have the right market uh, uh, idea here, but it might be a good one from a public policy uh, perspective. Um, I I do want to warn the group, however that if we went to say a 55 or 60% uh, requirement, we would not have the bingo amendment from 2018. It, it only had 52%. So, you know, you're playing with fire here. Um, I, I tend to agree with Jim's, I don't know that I agree with the double vote, but I do agree with the premise behind it, which is it shouldn't be harder to get on the ballot. That isn't the problem because we don't really have that many things making it on the ballot. Um, and it does cost a lot of money and there are things that can go wrong in terms of signature gathering. So uh, I probably on the theory of keeping it simple would be more with my friend, the speaker of perhaps raising the threshold rather than the double vote. Um, I, I think that makes some sense. And uh, so I'll stop there. I think you had another topic, Judge. Well, I do. It's it's related. Uh, you you mentioned the money and the political consultants and the media buyers who, uh, who who enrich themselves on these on these amendments. And if you had two votes, there would be you know just more of that going around. But we're we're talking about two different thresholds, right? We're talking about the threshold by which a measure passes, but before that, it has to get on the ballot. And so the number or percentage of signatures that need to be gathered and valid signatures that need to be gathered. So as I understand it, typically 
the, um, the petition, the signature gatherers are folks who are paid per signature. At least that's what I'd seen a number of times. And so if we, and then oftentimes the signatures are challenged and the signatures are reviewed. And if the signatures are not valid, those are stricken out. They're not considered at all. And then, so you have to get, as uh, uh, you mentioned earlier, more signatures than the actual threshold number. So if we raise that threshold number of signatures that you have to get, are we essentially making it even more of a special interest process, right? So that now that we're raising the number of signatures, we're also raising the amount of money that one needs to just get something on the ballot, much less the media campaign to promote it once it's on the ballot. So would you, would you address that issue of how the, how the raising of the number of signatures to get something on the ballot may or may not play into the hands of what people say are special interests or moneyed interests who, uh, and it's no longer really the people's ability, you know, the average person's ability to get something on the ballot. Yeah, sure. Um, and John's right. I think he had the statistics about right. Uh, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you collect wisely um, and you, you have a strategy that you're going for six of the eight congressional districts and ignoring the other two, which is what signature gathering people do, you, uh, you need about 120,000 signatures. If it is generally thought that if you have a really well-organized, well-done signature gathering operation, you could get about a 65% validity rate. Nobody cuts it that close. Generally, people want to have twice the amount needed. And this is all very sophisticated, by the way. I mean, the signature gathering people are doing nightly tracking and verification. So they know with a very high level of accuracy how many signatures they have in each congressional district um, almost on a nightly basis as they're, as they're doing this. Judge, there's no question that this is, a, a, you know, th this is expensive. Uh, but increasingly, people are feeling it's a route that gives that that's worth the money for a couple reasons. Um, first, it can take years to get something through the legislature. And, you know, th that might be wise. Uh, but increasingly, people are saying to themselves, well, if I have a sophisticated lobbying effort over several years in the General Assembly, that's not cheap either. Uh, there's a lot of education that goes into that and building sort of a grassroots campaign that might be that would educate the legislature about the need for it, um, and we. The speaker's also right. Uh, whether you like this or not, if I were sitting in the general assembly, I probably wouldn't, John. So I get where you're coming from. But this has largely become now a way to get something that you couldn't get in the legislature. I mean, most of the things that have passed that, that are high profile, uh, you know, clean Missouri, uh, the, the campaign finance amendments in 2016, uh, Medicaid expansion, most of those have been things that have been before the General Assembly and the proponents have failed. So uh, to, to, to convince the General Assembly to enact them or put them on the, either as a statute or to put them on the ballot. So uh, there's no question that, uh, you know, this is something of an end run. And there's, it, it already is an option that is not really low cost and grassroots. So changing the, the number makes it, I guess, a little more of that, but I'm not sure it really fundamentally changes what the system already is right now. So uh, following up on that notion, um, you've, you've outlined a number of different proposals. Was any of these what one would call a grassroots proposal going back to uh, 2012? Um, let me just take a look at my notes. Um, maybe a couple could be described that way. Um, although, you know, with some help from moneyed interests, but, um, you know, the big public policy things you have to spend the money to get on the ballot, and then you have to run the media campaign to convince the voters. And um, what's interesting is there have been huge disparities in that second part of the spending. Millions of dollars on one side and almost nothing on the other. Now, sometimes those have not come out the way the money, uh, the money would dictate. But, um, you know, any competent 
Uh, well, let me back up. There is a whole art to, to doing this. And grassroots signature gathering with volunteers is something that many of these people have used. And, there, and one of the reasons you do that is you build support for it because people feel invested in it because they're out helping do the work to gather the signatures. So uh, I think your question, Judge, in a way, sort of asks a binary question that maybe doesn't really exist. It's not, it's not just a grassroots effort over here and it's not just a money thing over here. An effective uh, campaign has elements of both. Thank you. And so I'm gonna to turn to Jim then on the issue of this notion of two votes and how you know, in a sense, kind of a similar concept, and that's the tenor of some of the questions we're getting from the audience as well, is, uh, you know, is this really helping the people of the state of Missouri, or is it really helping those people who make money off these, these, this process, and is it helping only those who have enough money to sustain and maintain two campaigns to get something on the ballot twice and to, you know, run the, run the campaign to get people to vote for it? Well, I think, uh, I think it depends on whether you look at it short term or long term. Um, the, largely, it would uh, end many of these efforts. Um, they would either be too expensive or too frustrating. It uh, just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't happen. Um, and and if, you, if you, like me, think the Missouri Constitution has gotten to be too complex, too much like a statute, then slowing down that process is, is a value. And uh, whether it's done, whether these are things put on the, the ballot by the initiative petition of the legislature, it doesn't matter. Both places can come up with things that really don't deserve uh, to be in our constitution. And uh, long term, we can slow that down. Uh, and that's that's part of why we we urge that. Uh, but you know, all, much of this discussion is about the initiative petition. But uh, I don't want the, the legislature off the hook. Um, I mean, the legislature puts things on the ballot because in, in a particular year, people in the legislature think, oh, if I put this on the ballot, then I can claim I got it on the ballot. I changed the Constitution. And many of those things are either pointless or they have collateral consequences that we haven't seen yet. And yet they get on the ballot. They are often passed. Uh, and the, the speaker has a, a proposal that would let the legislature say unilaterally with no check on the ballot what things are so they could describe it however they want. Um, you know, in, in my view, the legislature, too, ought to, uh, to, to be restricted in the way it can change the Missouri Constitution. And that's why we focus, one reason we focus on the, the threshold and not just on this process of getting things on the ballot. The Constitution should not be used as just a place where people can get things on for their own kind of political purposes short term. It should be a place that we deal with the fundamental questions about how the state of Missouri should operate. Let me, uh, I'm going to turn it to the speaker in just a moment, but one, one other just concept that I'll mention for, for everyone to consider, our panelists as well as our audience, is that when you go through the legislative process, you're not finished, right? If you get a bill passed by the House and the Senate, then it goes to the governor, right? And in our state, the governor can either veto it or not, or sign it or not sign it at all, and it becomes law without a veto. So there's, you know, another hurdle to clear. There's another branch of government. There's the, you know, another people's elective, elected representative in the process. So just I, I put that out there uh, conceptually for people to consider. Well, but keep in mind, the legislature can put things on the ballot uh, that was concealed carry that are not constitutional amendments. Uh, if the legislature wants to do that and wants to avoid having something have to get the governor's signature. So they, they can do that. They occasionally do do that. So I, I think Jim is uh, invoking the goose gander rule. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander in some senses, right? But that I think the, the speaker would like an opportunity to be heard on this issue. Mr. Speaker, please. Well, I appreciate that opportunity. Uh, you know, with regards to Jim's comments about uh, uh, politicians wanting to do things during election years, I just find it completely uncalled for and unreasonable. Uh, but in reality, I tell people, you know what, um, it's, it's, it's politics. It's, you know, we're, we're elected uh, by our, our respective citizens in our districts. We come up here to represent our, you know, I always tell people we're, we're state reps, so we're not district reps, but we're here to represent the interests of the 
citizens of Missouri, but politics is in everything. Politics is even in, in our court systems, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, politics is everywhere. And, and so I think, you know, as politicians, uh, do we do we sometimes take advantage of that opportunity to put something on the ballot that probably shouldn't be on the ballot uh, because either we know it's not going to pass or one, we we want to make a we want to grandstand or try to get attention. Certainly that happens. And, and that's I, I would hope that's not something that's on a regular basis. But I think more importantly, you know, the reason and I agree with the idea that, you know, raising the standard for collecting signatures and things along that lines. I don't know if that necessarily is going to be the solution to our to our, our perceived problems, but certainly changing our constitution should not be an easy, easy process. And right now with just getting a simple majority vote um, one time, to me, it's just too easy. And that needs to be that standard needs to be raised. As far as the other aspects of it, the number of signatures and where they come from, you know, that's in my opinion, it's open for debate. Um, but you know the the whole process of passing laws in 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 our country in 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 our state, you know the legislature has that has that right. That is what we're that's our purpose is to you know pass laws. Um, it's not the purpose of the judiciary. It's not the purpose of the executive branch. And so when you have direct initiative petitions, you're basically having you're not really having a republic, you're having direct democracy and you're having, you know, almost a, to a certain extent mob rule where, where they're going out and, and coming up with legislative ideas, putting it on the ballot that haven't been vetted. I mean, that's why it takes so long to get bills passed in this, in this, in this legislature, because, you know, when we have, we have hearings, we have, we debated on the floor. It has to go through many, many, many gyrations of review um, before it gets, you know, signed and even then it may not be signed by the governor. And then we have challenges by the courts or by, you know, people who challenge the laws, they'll take it to the courts. And then you guys get to decide whether it's, it's constitutional or not. So, you know, I think it is well within our right as a legislature to, to, you know, develop laws, propose laws, and, and even to the, to the extent to uh, propose a law and have the citizens vote on it. So um, I think that's, well within our with our legal right and our constitutional right to do that. And um, I think, you know, for us in the future, you know, we're going to be trying to do what we can to protect that right. Thank you. So a um, couple of more topics quickly before we turn to questions from the audience, and I see a number of them continue to come in. So the correction mechanism, and this is a theme of some of the questions that, that we've received, this correction mechanism. So uh, I think Lowell and Jim essentially agree on that, that there's a necessity of a correction mechanism for some of these provisions, especially some of these more detailed provisions. Uh, some of the questions centered on whether, is there a specific problem with the, the medical marijuana uh, in the provision that needs to be corrected and the like. So with respect to the correction mechanism, I, I want the speaker to address that first, if he would, because recognizing that the legislature can propose certain amendments, do, do you see the need for a correction mechanism once something is actually in the Constitution? Well, you know, I, depending on how it's put into the Constitution, I think if it's done through a process where we, there's been lots of contemplation, there's been lots of review, um, it's a, it's a, it's an issue that that was well thought out and, and was put in the Constitution. I'm more reluctant to really, to not uh, go back and try to change it. Um, in our case, with the Missouri Constitution, we have a lot of stuff that's been added to it. I, I like the idea that Jim laid out as far as, you know, I'm all about doing things easier and, you know, and not working, working, working harder, but working smarter. And if we could if, if perhaps we could create a commission to review our existing constitution and try to find ways to streamline it and get it back to where it should be as a true constitutional document versus something more like a statute, uh, revised statutes. But, um, you know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, constitutional, I mean, cons amendments to the constitution should be a big thing, should be a big deal. And we should be very reluctant to change those. We should be very reluctant to put things on the constitution. Um, so if it's already on there, I think it's, you know, it's, it's within our, our purview to every 20 years, if we want to, to, to address it and, and have a convention if we need to, or have a commission. 
and take up those issues and, and, and hopefully think them through and decide whether it's something we should continue to keep in the Constitution or take out. But I think back to my original point is, is that ultimately, I think that's why I'm making the issue that we should be very, we should set that bar very high with regards to changing our Constitution or amending our Constitution. Thank you. So, uh, Jim and, and Lowell, if you'd each just give a, a just a little bit about the correction process and how that would, um, how in your view, we could have a correction process that would uh, not disenfranchise the voters who voted for a particular amendment. Yeah, I'll just, go ahead, Jim. Any correction process that I propose, I think would still be on the ballot as a, uh, as a new change. So I don't think the voters would uh, be cut out of that process. Um, but I see this, this process as in part being a requirement because if you, if you increase the threshold for uh, making changes to the Constitution, then you need some method of uh, a more expedited method of uh, addressing issues that are created in those, uh, in those amendments or that, have, or that exist in, in current provisions. And that's part of why we proposed it. But part of it is to try and, and make a document that is a little bit more coherent, um, maybe shorter, uh, a little more coherent. And so let me give two areas that that might, uh, might be of value um, and, and, uh, and an example of where it was done in the past. The example in the past is in 1976 when our entire judicial article was rewritten. Um, so all the court system was, uh, was redone in Missouri in 1976. Not the first time that's happened in Missouri. Uh, back in the 1800s, there was a day where the Constitution was amended to abolish all circuit judgeships and then create new ones. So the new governor got to appoint all of the judges uh, in Missouri. What a deal. Um, but it was a coherent effort uh, to, to have a single article redone at the, all at once to address the judiciary. And two areas that we might think about doing something like that are, first off, one of those that was mentioned uh, by the speaker uh, when you list the uh, kinds of things in our current constitution, uh, when, when you mentioned bingo and uh, horse racing and raffles, that's all there because we have a prohibition in our constitution on the legislature allowing for lotteries. And then we keep creating these little exceptions like uh, a casino within a thousand feet of the main channel on the Missouri or Mississippi rivers or a raffle by a charitable institution. And, and it may be that we could come back and, and pull all those together and, and develop something that's more coherent. The, actually the longest uh, number of the longest sections deal with uh, state debt. And we have various provisions that deal with where the state can have debt. And it may be that those ought to be revised in a way uh, that, that is more coherent than these things that just happen uh, one at a time. And so my hope would be that if we created a commission that it would be proactive, uh, that would actually look at provisions at full sections of the constitution and say, okay, what are we really trying to accomplish here? Can we do that in a way that just makes more sense, not just gets rid of unconstitutional provisions like women not being on juries, but, but actually makes more sense and will help us in the future to be able to address the needs of Missourians. Thank you, Jim. Lowell, well, just briefly on the uh, correction mechanism. Yeah, uh, in, in general, I, I think Jim's got a, a good idea that that's something we need to look at. I will say one person's error is another person's careful drafting. So the, the slope is pretty slippery on that. Uh, so while in general, I, I do like the concept and, and I will say it, there's a definitional issue here too, because uh, I don't see a lot of just outright errors, you know, where the wrong word is used, but I do think some of the measures both internally lack any coherence and then don't fit very well with things that exist. Jim makes a good point. Uh -oh, we've lost Lowell's audio. So Jim, I guess that's uh, fortunate. Lowell, or maybe unfortunate, Lowell was just saying you make a good point. <laughs> and then we lost him. Uh, so with that, Lowell, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but we'll, uh, we'll move on to some audience questions and then we can bring this back to you if we get you back. So 
A number of the questions, uh, I alluded to this earlier, a number of folks have, have asked for pointing to examples of the need for correction. Some have asked because the medical marijuana one has come up a number of times today, are there specific problems with me the medical marijuana amendment or are there others that have specific issues that do need to be amended uh, or, or that, that, that there's a, I guess, uh, let's call it a robust consensus that there's a need for amendment or, or, or correction as opposed to, uh, as what Lowell was saying, that one, you know, one person's error is another person's careful drafting. So, uh, Jim, I see you smiling and looking as if you're ready to address that. And that that's in part because I saw that uh, who it was who was posing the questions about medical marijuana, and I'm sure that he had a role in drafting that. Um, I don't know that I see something there that is a problem today, but I see things that may be a problem tomorrow. And so let me give you an example there of something that could be a problem. Uh, there's a provision in the medical marijuana uh, amendment that provides for the applications that are submitted to the Department of Health and Senior Services to be confidential. They have to be maintained as confidential. Uh, we're currently in court, uh, currently in the Court of Appeals, addressing whether that means that uh, the applications submitted by those who want to have uh, dispensary or cultivation or manufacturing licenses are confidential uh, from their competitors who are litigating the denial of their own licenses. In the course of doing that, of deciding that, the courts are gonna decide what confidentiality means. Well, let's suppose that the proponents even of the medical marijuana uh, amendment don't like how the, uh, uh, the courts have interpreted this concept of confidentiality and whether their names and information can be kept confidential from other litigants. Their solution then would only be to have a new constitutional amendment because they couldn't go to the General Assembly and say, fix this, because the General Assembly would have to say, we can't fix this because you put it in the constitution. And that's the kind of thing that concerns me, not that I can name things today, but we have, uh, we have kind of taken these, these details and, and it may not make sense that a stem cell violation should be subject to a particular criminal penalty anymore, but to change it, we have to go to the voters in a constitutional amendment. And that simply doesn't make any sense to me. And Jim, do you, are you familiar with any situations where there has been an amendment of an amendment that was proposed by the initiative or pa no. rather passed by the initiative? Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, the legislature did that recently with this cleaner Missouri um, which also gets back to this whole title question, uh, because uh, the title the legislature passed there, the court said, was just outrageous. Um, but it, it, it happens that one thing gets passed over another. But, you know, the, the cost, even under current thresholds, the cost of getting something on the ballot to once is so high that, uh, that they don't come back and, and do it and do it again. All right. So uh, we've got a couple of more minutes before I turn it back to Mark Bremer. But uh, so Speaker Wyman, it uh, seems that you might have something to say there in response to what Jim has said about this amendment, as well as the, uh, the, the ballot title issue uh, specific to cleaner Missouri and perhaps others. So please. You know, what do they say was good, good for the goose is good, good for the gander. I mean, same scenario here. I, I actually joke around here in the legislature. I said, all we have to do is pass a bill. We put the word clean or medicinal or benevolent in front of it and everybody will be supportive of it. So. You know, it's okay for them to do that. Those on the opposite side of, of whatever issue it is for them to use the ballot candy language and whatnot. But then when we do it, then all of a sudden it's a, it's, it's, it's outrageous that we did the same thing that they did, but you know, I get it. I understand, you know, it's all, once again, it goes back to my whole point is that when you put something on the ballot, you have people who are voting for it who, and I hate to say that they're not qualified to be voting on this, but they have not spent the time and invested the, the, the energy in, in researching and understanding, especially a constitutional amendment, a very complex, you know, proposal to change our constitution or add to our constitution. We're, we're letting citizens make those decisions. Um, and they're making it based on very flimsy, um, minimal information. And I just think that that's, that's a concern that we need to address. You mentioned earlier in your, in your opening remarks the notion that the average voter doesn't read the actual language of the amendment. They rely on the ballot title and they rely on uh, the marketing campaigns around those. 
what are the fixes for that in your view? How do we change that? I mean, and really, in a sense, it's a, it's a question that gets to, can we really, it's a sociological experiment, can we really change voter behavior in that regard, or at least with the, the depth that's necessary to get to what you're getting at? But uh, I'll leave that to the social scientists, but, but would love your comments on that. Well, you know, I, I certainly think taking longer, I, I like the idea, like Jim suggested, maybe we, we, we have a vote, maybe we have a second vote that gives more time for it to sink in, more education to, to occur. It always seems like we're always rushing the last minute to get the word out to, hey, support this amendment or support that petition, be against it, be for it. And you have your talking points. Um, I, I don't know if there's a if there's an immediate fix to a long term social problem where people have a lack of interest in our government in the first place. Um, that's been going on for a long time. And I don't know how you fix that. But, you know, it's just I think we need to be very careful about putting people in those positions where they're making decisions um, that have effects in our Constitution where they really haven't had the, the, the opportunity or they haven't taken the opportunity to really educate themselves before they vote on an issue. Um, I, I can tell you that, quite honestly, there's people in the legislature, and I'm not naming names, but there's people in the legislature probably haven't even read some of the bills they voted for. And we're supposed to be the professionals. So I'm just saying that this is something that we need to, we need to be cognizant of and be aware of that you know, when we're putting this ballot issue before the people, uh, we can put it as plain language as we can, but as we all know, sometimes it's a very complex issue. We don't understand what the ramifications are long term. I mean, medical marijuana, for example, and I'll end on this. That was, once again, another issue that was proposed in this, in this building many, many times. I did surveys in my district. Anytime I said it was for medicinal purposes, I got like 60 or 70 percent of my constituents said, yes, I want it. But the minute I said recreational, they said, no, they don't want it. It was like 30 percent wanted it. Um, and so I saw this one coming a long way away but the, those that were in favor of medical marijuana, they went around us because they knew they couldn't get it to the legislature. I heard testimony after testimony from sheriffs and policemen and so forth from Colorado and other states, California, where they've adopted the recreational marijuana. And it was not a pretty sight, but that information was never just, just you know, distributed or just, you know, where people could hear that mainstream around the state. So that's the problem. You, you, know, you know, it's it's just easy to, to, to package it up, put it away in, in a way that it, people think, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And then they vote for it impulsively and vote for something that then now is permanently in the Constitution, which we can't fix later on without a lot of effort. So I'll end with that. All right, thank in, you. In order to keep us on schedule, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, I thought this was highly informative, uh, well-researched and authoritative discussion by you, Jim, Lau, and John. And thank you very much, Judge Clark, for your well-informed guidance of the discussion. Thank you all.